Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the session, The Brains Behind the Operation, Evidence-Based English Language Teaching. Um, my name is Carol Leatherby. I'm a teacher, educator, and materials writer, and I'm based in San Francisco, California. And I'm Patricia Harris. I'm also a teacher, educator, and a teacher, and currently I'm in Colombo, Sri Lanka. So we're doing this um, in different places uh, as well. Um, okay, what we're going to talk about today then is the fact that the brain is behind the operation. And what I'm referring to here as the operation is learning. We're also going to talk about using what we know about how we learn based on science and neuroscience. And what we're really interested in is applying this to English language teaching. Um, so first question, what does the brain have to do with teaching? Well, of course, this is a facetious question because the brain is how we learn. Um, uh, as we mentioned in the title, we are not neuroscientists, but like many teachers, we are very interested in the brain and how we learn and curious about how the brain works. Now, up until recently, um, the physical brain really um, had been kind of ignored in general education and certainly in English language teaching. But with the growth of technologies like um, fMRI, uh, we're beginning to get more of an idea what happens in the, the brain um, when people are learning. Um, and we're going to look at that as well as some ideas from um, cognitive science as well and psychology. Um, now, interestingly enough, the, this kind of interest in the brain, which many teachers have, and um, research has shown, you know, up to kind of 70, 80 percent of, of teachers around the world are interested in the brain, has actually led to the idea of um, neuromyths. Um, and these neuromyths being perpetuated. And you can probably guess what a neuromyth is. It's something that people believe about the brain, which is actually not true about the brain. And um, uh, Patricia is now going to tell you a little bit about some research that we did um, into the question of teacher beliefs and neuromyths, particularly amongst English language teachers. Yes, so we, um, we surveyed 332 English language teachers in the USA, Canada, Mexico, and Brazil. And we gave them a series of statements, um, nine statements about the brain and learning. And amongst these statements um, were some neuromyths, some untruths. And we asked the uh, teachers simply to go through the statements and say whether they agreed with the statements or they didn't. Um, we don't have time to go into the full paper or the full study today, but please have a look at the end at our references if you're interested in seeing um, more about this. But we'll just focus on two of the most popular and most prevalent neuromyths in education for today. So here are these, these two very popular ones. Please read through these. So these are two neuromyths that were amongst our statements and now we're going to have a look at how many of our teachers believed these myths to be true. So as you can see at the bottom here, we've got the left brain, right brain, and that 60% of our teachers believing that statement to be true. And then 90% of our teachers believe the learning styles myth to be true. So as Pashla et al say, our intuitions and beliefs about how we learn as teachers are often wrong in serious ways. Now, we'll just have a closer look at number five, the first of those two, because it is such a popular um, belief. So this is about hemispheric dominance and the, the, the idea that you've probably seen in popular science that we have a left side of the brain that is, is responsible for analytic and logical thinking, and we have a right side of the brain that is more creative. Now, neuroscientists have told us that this is not in fact the case, and that both hemispheres are used for processing both logical and creative tasks. And more interestingly for us as language teachers, both hemispheres of the brain are involved in foreign language learning. And in fact, in the classroom, there's no point in trying to teach to help 
one side of the brain becomes stronger. So there's no evidence that some people have better connected or more dominant left or right brain networks. Now, as for um, the learning styles neuromyth, um, uh, as Patricia just pointed out, we found in our survey that about 90% of the teachers that we surveyed believe that this um, is true. This idea that if you uh, match teaching and learning in terms of uh, people's preferred um, sensory uh, modality, that this will improve learning. This is something which neuroscientists consider to be a neuro myth. Okay, so what are some of the problems with it? Well, the main problem is this, that there is no convincing evidence that teaching to preferred learning style enhances learning. This is known as the meshing hypothesis or the matching hypothesis. Um, there have been several studies, however, which have tried to kind of prove the matching hypothesis. And um, one of the most famous ones um, is a, a series of a couple of experiments which have been done by Rogowski and colleagues. And what they found in their study is that there was no significant relationship between your preferred mode of learning, the teaching mode, and the results of the test. So um, this means that basically um, they didn't find that listening um, in a listening test that so-called auditory learners um, outperformed uh, so-called visual learners and vice versa they didn't find the the converse to be true either so what they did find though and again this is very very interesting for us as teachers they found that learners who were identified as visual learners consistently outperformed auditory learners and what they conclude from this and i think this is important for us too for all teachers is that it's not actually just harmless for us to um, test people's learning styles and uh, or learning preferences and to um, teach according to them. It is potentially we're doing learners a disservice if we focus on this because um, being a good visual learner um, is absolutely essential in our um, educational system because it's based on reading and writing. Um, Newton and Salvi have uh, just done some recent, um, a recent meta-analysis of um, about uh, from samples all over the world in all types of education, and they found just like we did in, in our survey, that about 90% of educators around the world report that they believe in the meshing hypothesis. And more interestingly, even though neuroscientists have been telling us now for, for uh, several years that this is a neuro myth, um, there is still no sign that this number is declining. So, you know, they argue, and this is what we're going to look at now, is that perhaps spending all our time on debunking myths is maybe that's not the correct approach to take as, as teachers and teacher educators, but rather we should be thinking about what are effective approaches instead of spending our time saying these aren't effective, these things don't work. And that's what we're going to do in the rest of our presentation now. We're going to focus on interventions that do have a research but research base. And what we're talking about here is something that we've been working on for a few years now. And in fact, we've, um, we've just fi finished a book about this in English language teaching, which will be coming out later this year. Um, Evidence-based teaching, or sometimes called evidence-informed teaching. Now, when we're talking about um, evidence based or evidence informed teaching, where is the evidence? What evidence are we talking about? Well, we mentioned neuroscience, but we're not just talking about um, neuroscience here. We're, we're talking about what has been called the science of learning. That is evidence which is derived from the scientific method. And this could be from several different fields, including neuroscience, cognitive science, psychology, and educational research. Basically any field that, that um, has done this kind of uh, experimentation derived from the scientific method.
All right. So the rest of our presentation, then what we're going to focus on is what does work, what does in education, what does have uh, an evidence base to back it up. And then we're going to look more closely at how can we apply um, this evidence based strategy or intervention to English language teaching. All right, we're going to focus on four particular um, strategies or interventions. And they, you know, some of them are quite broad. And as you'll see, they're quite um, interlinked as well. But here they are. Um, we're going to focus on using what learners already know and not overloading learners. OK, so we'll talk about how what that means for um, the classroom of the English language teaching classroom. We're going to talk about spaced and interleaved retrieval practice and why um, evidence says that this is effective and how we can we can do this in language teaching. We're going to look at the idea that practice tests lead to retention of information. So we'll be focusing too on that and how we can um, use that information in English language teaching. And we're going to focus on the strategy of metacognitive awareness with the idea that metacognitive awareness can help learning. We'll look at the evidence for this and then we'll um, talk about how we can apply it to English language teaching. OK, so our first one then, uh, using what learners already know. OK, so this is something that um, has been known for some time um, in cognitive psychology, that we need to use what learners al already know to help them to learn new things. OK, um, as Howard Jones says here, um, to, for new learning to be acquired, it must also be connected to prior knowledge. Now, what this means, of course, for teachers then is that teachers need to find out and activate what learners know already. Now, we know about this, too, from neuroscience. This is um, from um, a couple of neuroscientists, uh, Van Kestren and um, Howard Jones and his team. And they talk about how the building of new knowledge is often accompanied by increased activation of the prefrontal regions of the brain. And using the technology I've talked about, this fMRI technology, we're able to see now that um, areas of activation when people are learning new things. We also know about this from cognitive psychology, this idea that learners, um, what learners know already is what is going to um, help them to learn new things. Marzano talks very um, uh, at length about this too, that what students already know about the content is one of the strongest indicators of how well they will learn new, new information relative to the content. And obviously, this is a very, very important um, uh, piece of information and research for all teachers. Now, let's have a look um, specifically at second language learners, English learners. What kinds of prior knowledge do they bring with them to the classroom? Well, first of all, they're going to bring with them, of course, content, background knowledge of um, content areas and subject matter. But they're also going to bring with them uh, background knowledge of their first language. So how can we take advantage of that in the classroom? That's what we need to be asking ourselves. And of course, they bring with them their previous background knowledge of English, what they've learned already, if you like. OK, so thinking about these different types of um, background knowledge, how can we use that to help learners to learn uh, more readily? OK. So a first idea then, this idea of using pre-tasks, especially before we teach a, a reading or a listening text. Um, here we're talking about um, activating background knowledge, building background knowledge before learners um, actually uh, start listening or start reading. And what we're trying to do here is two things. We're trying to make sure that they are, um, they know, the language that's going to come up, the, if, especially if there's any new language that's going to come up in the text, that they, they have some idea of what this means before they come across it in the text. And secondly, they have some ideas too about the content and what they're going to read about, because we know that having this background information before they start is going to actually help the, uh, the reading 
become uh, be easier for them, more manageable. OK, so that's there's an example. We just have the um, <clears throat> here. Here are the pre tasks and here's the reading that accompanies it. OK, our second idea then for how we can help learners um, uh, with background knowledge, um, this idea of recycling and building on what learners know. This is something, too, that scientists and neuroscientists and cognitive psychologists talk about this idea in English language teaching of using some kind of spiral curriculum, starting from what learners already know. So that could be, for example, in vocabulary teaching. This is a, an example of uh, some textbook materials which were designed for um, Spanish and Portuguese. Portuguese speak speakers. And if you notice, there are 15 new vocabulary words here. Now, 15 new words is a lot to introduce to students in one go. But if you notice, they've been decided, divided into two columns. And the first column, those first eight vocabulary words, are actually cognates in Spanish. So what we're saying is if we can activate what learners know already, get them to realize that these are cognates, then really it's only the ones on the other side, the seven on the other side, which are actually new words. Um, we need to do this too in um, grammar teaching, the same kind of idea. And as Van Kesteren, the neuroscientist, talks about, this is absolutely essential because knowledge builds on what has come before it. Okay, the third idea then for how we can use what learners know to help them to learn more easily. Um, this idea of finding out about um, learners' interests and what they know about those, those interests and topics. Why is this important? Well, we're most interested and motivated um, by the things we already know something about. Um, and there's this kind of complex relationship between motivation and engagement and success in learning. Um, so if we can um, make sure learners, um, uh, we know what learners are interested in and we can take advantage of that, this will lead to success in learning, which will then motivate learners again to, to learn more. OK, um, our fourth idea then for how we can help learners to use what they know already to learn more easily is this idea of not overloading learners. And it's all related, again, to the way the, the, the brain works and particularly the way memory works. That if we try to give uh, learners too much information in one go, this um, overload is going to lead to information loss because we do have a very limited short term memory. So if you do try to introduce too many brand new words to, to students in one go, this is going to mean that um, the an item in process will be have to be dropped for a new one, or it will just be completely overwhelming and learners won't process any of the, the new words or learn any of the new words, if you like. Now, this leads us then to um, uh, what comes next. We know that um, new learning, when learners have learned something, they've, they've just learned it, um, they're, they're, this new learning is vulnerable is more vulnerable to loss. And while we're using effort to process, to remember and apply new information, the working memory is at full capacity. But as we consolidate our learning, um, uh, the effort becomes less and it becomes more permanent as we make these connections stronger, these neurological connections stronger. And that allows us to use automatic processing and then working memory is freed up for new learning. Now, this brings us to um, our in second important strategies um, or interventions, and that is how to do practice in the classroom. So the importance of practice, and Patricia is going to talk to you now about how um, uh, effective ways of practice according to research. Okay, just have a quick look at this and uh, be honest with yourself, which of these two uh, strategies have you followed in your, in your academic career? Um, it should be clear to you as you are teachers that it's the first picture here, studying a few minutes every day, which is considered to be the effective method and not 
to cram or do math practice the day before the exam. Now this is known as spaced or a distributed retrieval practice. And it's the idea of spreading out practice activities over time. We'll talk about interleaved practice in a minute, but just focusing on the spaced practice, this is, a, this is something that we've known about for a very long time. Ebbinghaus in 1885 uh, published a paper on learning and memory. And what he found was that space practice leads to great, much greater long-term retention. And that is the key here. We can cram before an examination and perform well in the examination, but will we remember the content a few weeks or months later? And there has been a lot of research into this since. Um, and the reason why it works, the researchers say, is because it's the, the, the time between each practice session when we forget what we've been learning. That is actually beneficial. And then coming back to the content and trying to retrieve it is what makes it integrate well with our existing knowledge. And this is known as the theory of disuse. Now, can we use this in the English language teaching classroom? Well, we probably already do. Have a look at the first idea here with vocabulary. We do recycle vocabulary. Now, the key here, if we're focusing on distributed or space practice is to think about um, adding increasingly greater time spaces between each time we revisit that content. Of course, we can use this strategy um, simply by beginning a lesson with practice of language from a previous lesson. And we're not talking about the lesson that's just come immediately before, but perhaps a lesson that you, you taught a, a week ago or a month ago. And finally, we need to ask our students to plan their own study timetables, taking this uh, strategy into account. Okay, the second of the two um, techniques we're talking about here is interleaved practice. Now it is as it sounds. So rather than blocked practice where we're practicing the same content in a concentrated form and then moving on to another uh, topic, the idea is to mix up different practice activities that need to be related in some way in a single session. So we're going over and switching between the content um, and going over it in perhaps a different order next time. And as we do this, we're making links between the content. Now, the research that's been done into this has been mainly into concept learning and, and mathematics. But what the researchers have found is that it, they think that interleaved practice may improve the brain's ability to tell concepts apart and help learners to choose the correct problem solving strategy. And of course, it's the difficulty in having to switch between the different content that's making this effective because again, it's the retrieval um, that's helping to integrate. And this difficulty known as desirable difficulty is leading to greater retention in the, in the long term. Interleaved practice, do we do it in the English language classroom? Well, again, I think we do when we mix language and skills practice up in class. But the key of course is not to be too predictable with this and keep the learners on their toes. We can also mix up practice of language structures in one session. And we can review material in a different order from the order in which it was presented. When schools timetable classes, perhaps they should look at not having all the skills um, classes in the morning and the language, focus on language in the afternoon, but integrating these more. And then once again, we need to ask our learners to try to incorporate this kind of practice when they're studying at home by themselves. This example from Cutting Edge, um, I will, we were looking at this and we thought, well, it does look like it's actually exemplifying this technique because we're moving between different areas of skills and language. So you can see preparation for a listening involves speaking and vocabulary work. Then students are going to do some listening on the topic. Then they will speak about the topic feed in some um, functional language, and then finally um, do some writing. Okay, right, our third um, strategy or intervention um, that has a strong research base behind it is this idea of 
practice testing and how practice tests lead to the retention of information. Um, now, when, when we think of tests, very often we think of this um, high stakes pressure tests where learners get nervous and perform badly, etc. That's not what we're talking about here. And that's not what's necessary. What we're talking about here are so called low or no stakes tests, and even self testing, because this has overwhelmingly been shown to improve learning. And again, it comes back to uh, this idea of um, retrieval practice, the importance of retrieval practice. Again, something that we have known for over 100 years in this case. Um, this is known as the, the testing effect, the idea that practicing retrieving more information makes that information easier to retrieve in the future. The more learners retrieve the information, the more retrievable it becomes as the neural, neural connections become stronger. Um, and this has a, a positive effect both on teaching and on learning. It allows the learner to see that they, um, to see what it is they don't know and uh, do some kind of selective study, but it also allows teachers to see what the um, gaps are in what the learners know. And this is an area that has been done, um, worked on a lot in terms of language learning. And it has been found, particularly in the area of vocabulary learning, that um, retrieval practice is a very um, powerful way of helping learners to remember vocabulary. So doing these practice tests really helps learners to um, remember vocabulary. All right. Um, applications to English language teaching then? Well, as I've mentioned already, uh, vocabulary tests, these kinds of test yourself um, uh, practices, practice tests, um, all kinds of things that are, as I mentioned, low stakes or no stakes testing. But something very, uh, something else very interesting that comes out of the research is the idea that a recall test is better than a recognition test. That is, if the learners actually have to think about and recall a, a word for themselves, for example, rather than just matching a, a word and recognizing it and matching it to a picture, this is more successful. Recall testing is better than recognition testing. This also has um, implications, I think, for the kinds of assessment we do in the classroom. And rather than um, just giving learners one final test at the end of the semester, what the research suggests to us is that formative assessment, continuous assessment, self-testing all the way through the semester um, is, a, is, a much, um, is a much more effective way of helping learners to retain the information long term. Now, again, um, I'm not talking about high pressure tests. I'm talking about, for example, in this case, we have here, um, this is a, a game, basically. If you look, it's uh, for beginner learners. Um, it's a, an activity to learn the days of the week. The learners complete them, they listen to them. And then if you look at exercise E, in pairs, they take turns saying the days in order and they challenge each other to see who can say them more quickly. Now, as you see, it's in the form of a game as uh, kind of fun for the learners to, to, to try it out. But basically, this is a practice test. Um, and here we have uh, just another example of the same kind of thing. This is a self-assessment um, which allows learners to um, assess their own um, practice of um, assess their own learning of aspects that they've been working on in the last units or whatever. Um, and again, you'll see um, if you look at this, this really involves a, a, a recall test rather than recognition test in this part, certainly. OK. So the fourth evidence based strategy we're going to look at is metacognitive um, awareness techniques. So there are two um, that I want to talk about here. We want to talk about here. The first is elaborative interrogation. So this is the idea that learners use questions and they answer the questions in order to explain why something they've learned is true. So they uh, 
ask and answer questions. Now, here are some examples of the question forms that they could use. And of course, this can be done in the first language. So what does the research say about this? Well, elaborative interrogation, the, um, the connecting of old and new knowledge um, integrates the new information with the existing prior knowledge. And this is therefore building on the memories that the learners already have. Can we use this in the English language teaching classroom? Well, let's have a look. Yes, students can ask and answer questions about grammar rules and compare different structures. So just imagine you've got students sitting in pairs in your classroom and you're asking them to, to interrogate why some adjectives have an ing ending and some have an ed ending. They can also make connections between classroom language and language heard outside. And obviously this works for an ESL situation, but don't forget your learners are watching a lot of movies and, and interacting on the internet. So it's trying to take that, those rules and, uh, that they learn about in class and ask students to explicitly uh, challenge those rules when they hear the language being used. We can also, of course, ask learners to explain answers to their reading and comprehension uh, question tasks, perhaps looking at the vocabulary that helped them to achieve the answers in a reading um, comprehension exercise. Here's an example from um, a course book, and this is focusing on language. You can see it's a very common type of exercise, but what we like about this one is that the course book writers have asked the learners to say, explicitly say why the incorrect choice is incorrect. Okay, and then the second one under these uh, metacognitive strategies here today is self-explanation. Now, again, this is a question and answer technique, but what we're doing here is asking learners to think about the way they learn and to explain the features of their own learning to themselves. Here are some examples of the kinds of questions that they can use. And of course, this can be done in the first language. Now, the research into this area has focused a lot on the learning of mathematics. And what researchers have found is that um, watching learners um, solve one problem in mathematics and then giving them something new, they've been able to transfer their knowledge of how to solve the problem to a new problem by talking through the steps that they used to solve the old problem. Can we use this in the English language classroom? Well, self-explanation can come in, of course, when we run a feedback on reading and listening tasks. So when we ask our learners to say how they came to the answers that they have, um, they're explaining the steps that they took. And of course, learners can do this in pairs before we, we actually examine this as teachers. In language work, we can ask students to explain their thought processes to a partner as they're working through a, a language exercise in class. And this teaching that we, we do encourage in a classroom is a form of self-explanation. We can also ask learners to explain similarities and differences between new and previously studied material. So for example, if we're looking at the progressive aspect, the students have probably encountered this at beginner or elementary level. And when they're coming back to see it, this form again, they can think about what is it that they already know about how to form this and, on, and how is it used? Which verbs don't take an ING form? This course book series has a section called learning skills and within it, we, we found this example of um, what, we, what we see as self explanation. The learner is having to explicitly think and say why it is that they go through a pre-task before they, they listen to a text. Okay, so what we've seen here then, uh, what we've been looking at today are four uh, simple, free teaching strategies or interventions that have a wealth of evidence to support their use. First of all, we have this idea of using what learners already know and not overloading them so that we help learners to learn more easily based on what we know about the brain and about how we learn.
Um, secondly, we have this idea that space, spaced and interleaved retrieval practice is effective. So learners aren't cramming, but rather practicing or studying a little each day and interleaving, that is mixing up their practice. Thirdly, we have this idea of practice testing and that practice testing leads to uh, retention of um, information, where learners practice retrieving information so that it becomes easier and more automatic for them to be able to do so. And then fourthly, we have this idea that metacognitive awareness can help learning, where learners question themselves and their classmates about how they found answers, and learners talk about and discuss their thought processes. <clears throat> We talked about how these strategies have been found to be helpful across subject areas, but particularly focused on um, how to use them in situations where learners are learning in an English language teaching context. And that is really our big interest and focus. So um, a couple of conclusions then from our um, talk today. Uh, first of all, the brain is behind the operation. There's a connection between what we know about the brain, how we learn and teaching. Secondly, evidence-based strategies do exist. We should be aware of them and what the research says. Um, <clears throat> and rather than uh, spend time, as we talked about at the beginning, debunking things that aren't true and that don't work, let's focus on the things that do work. Um, we already do a lot of these things in the classroom, but what we've looked at today and what we'd like you to consider as well is this idea that we need thought and time to apply them in English language teaching in particular. And that's our interest. And we hope that uh, you will find this interesting too. Um, all right, these are the uh, references for our talk today. Um, I think we have time for a few questions now. Um, uh, I'll be available to answer some questions. Thank you very much for, for coming. We hope you enjoyed it.